Hello and welcome to the big picture. I'm Tina Jha. Eight states: Jharkhand, Mizoram, Odisha, Chhattisgarh, Assam, Bihar, Arunachal Pradesh, and West Bengal are highly vulnerable to climate change, according to the National Climate Vulnerability Assessment Report that was released recently. The assessment by the researchers from the Indian Institute of Science, Indian Institute of Technology at Mandi and Guwahati, funded by the Department of Science and Technology. has used the intergovernmental panel on climate change's fifth assessment report to define vulnerability and make state and district wise assessments now according to them these eight states which are mostly in the eastern part of the country require prioritization of adaptation interventions among all states assam bihar and jharkhand have over 60% districts in the category of highly vulnerable districts while himachal pradesh telangana sikkim and punjab have been categorized as lower middle vulnerable states the hill state of uttarakhand haryana tamil nadu kerala nagaland goa and maharashtra have been categorized as states with low vulnerability so on the big picture today we will analyze the key findings of the climate vulnerability assessment report the key drivers of vulnerability in these states the utility of the report in understanding climate risks and the measures that need to be taken to adapt to climate change so to discuss these aspects and much more i'm joined on the program today by two distinguished panelists let me first introduce them to you i have with me dr pradeep to ghosh distinguished fellow terry and ex secretary ministry of environment forest and climate change and mr abhinash mohanty program lead cew thank you gentlemen for joining me on this edition of the big picture Dr. Ghosh, so let me begin the program today with you. First, your views on the National Vulnerability Assessment Report that was released recently, and what are the factors that make these eight states that I just mentioned more vulnerable to climate change as compared to the other states? Well, first of all, we must take this vulnerability report seriously because this has been, uh, you know, uh, put together. by a team of very distinguished and qualified scientists in are in very prestigious institutions they have uh, relied upon sound uh, well established methodologies they have uh, used uh, a very robust data database available with the imd and other organization of the indian government so we should definitely take uh, the this report seriously as we go forward in planning for adaptation in these states now you see the the precise climate impacts in these eight states are variable it is not that there is one there is a single type of impact which is impacting all eight states but i think the one factor which is common to all these states is the high levels of poverty and it is poverty which in the presence of climate climate risks makes these states uh, you know uh, much more vulnerable so while we should take steps to address these questions of of climate change impacts it is all the more necessary to address the question of poverty in these states yes okay mr monty uh, your views on this uh, report how would you compare it to the previous cew analysis that had found that more than 75% of indian districts are vulnerable to extreme climate events so compared to your analysis uh, how similar or different is the current national vulnerability assessment report uh thank you tina and thank you dr ghosh for setting the context uh, well let me just give you the optics of vulnerability vulnerability is always a function of exposure sensitivity and adaptive capacity just to put in perspective exposure is how much exposed a particular geography is to a particular kind of uh, threat or climate risk and how much sensitive are they to different categories of uh, those extreme events and then what exactly is the kind of capacity that is available in terms of combating it or at least resisting it uh, in terms of that so that's where this whole equation comes down into vulnerability what we did in uh, december 2020 uh, the report that was released and you just mentioned we did an detailed exposure assessment from the re- from the lens of climate risk and we tried understanding how exactly is our districts vulnerable and exposed to different kinds of uh, extreme events 
uh, we what we also did was we didn't just look at single events. Uh, suppose if a cyclone comes in, cyclone will be there for two hours or a couple of hours, right? Uh, but what it makes or the impact gets uh, more compounded is uh, the storm surge, heavy rainfall that follows pre to the cyclone landfall and post to the cyclone landfall. And that those are the associated events. So we compounded all of them, included into our models, and then tried figuring out where our stand, uh, I mean, our district stand in terms of that. So this study is actually a first step. This was much due uh, at a national level to understand where our states, where our districts actually remain in. And both of them at one go complement each other and have their unique USBs also. But what it is more important is uh, the mainstreaming of climate risk at a subnational level and at a district level, even further below. So that's what has been missing from the mainstream debate. And probably with all these government functionaries and agencies coming together with this analysis and getting the inputs from uh, independent think tanks like us uh, will help in mainstreaming that agenda. That's point number one. And as a next step, what has to be done is uh, we need to go more granular in terms of looking at the nonlinear trends and complexities. Because uh, what our analysis suggests that 75% of the Indian districts are exposed to extreme hotspots, are the extreme hotspots of climate extremes. Uh, but at the same time, 40% of them shows uh, showcased a swapping trend. Uh, let me give you what exactly swapping trend means. Uh, flood prone areas are becoming drought prone and drought prone areas are becoming flood prone. So basically, if you are in a district where you plan and you say that you are prepared for floods, you actually end up witnessing droughts. So 40% of those districts, and these are huge numbers to talk of. A lot of population pans across. And the report, the National Vulnerability Report, not just talks about the eastern coast, it also talks about western coast. And our analysis also suggested that uh, the western coast is becoming increasingly vulnerable. And primarily, 89% of the coastal districts are also exposed to extreme climate events. So that's the optics uh, with numbers that I have just said you and hope that's helpful. Okay, so what is the way forward is something that I'll certainly come back to you. Uh, Dr. Gore, so because uh, what we are witnessing are extreme climate change events across different parts of the country, in terms of that, how helpful are such assessment reports in understanding the climate risks and also towards adaptation planning? Well, of course, these reports are the basis of adaptation planning. But I would also say that they are they constitute one important input for general development planning and general regional planning. So these reports are, of course, extremely useful. And I think, you know, if you are to look for a single talisman, because we must understand that although these reports, the studies have been, have been uh, conducted in a very rigorous way with a sound database and so on, the point is that there are still a number of uncertainties. And, uh, you know, events will unfold in the future and we will know the extent to which uh, these, uh, these, reports, uh, these, these reports actually replicate reality or to what extent they deviate from reality. But just to give one talisman that if a region is already stressed in a particular dimension, like, for example, drought, it is likely to be increasingly more stressed in that dimension. So even if there are, there may be some uh, discrepancies going forward between the actual manifestations of climate change and the projections of these reports, it would make sense for us. It would be, uh, these would be completely no, no regrets uh, options for us to address the current vulnerabilities in full measure. And so I don't think, you know, that we will be wasting our effort. We will be wasting our, our, our resources, you know, if we simply follow this talisman. Okay, Mr. Monty. So the report, uh, the, the recent national assessment report also talks about how the researchers have spoken on the need for prioritization of adaptation interventions. So uh, for our viewers, if you could explain what kind of prioritization do these states require and uh, going forward, what, what is the best way ahead? Okay, uh, and that's that's one of the best essence, and I really liked about this report uh, is the ground truthing and the ground validation that happened in terms of getting the end users or the community perspective into the uh, discussions and into the models that have been put forward. Uh, so adaptation plans includes uh, 
at an at a national level we do have our commitments and based on those commitments we have a national action plan on climate change and every state is mandated to develop a state action plan on climate change but what has happened of late is a lot of dynamism doesn't happen to be uh, seen in those documents uh, these documents are siloed within the uh, prerogative of the state forest departments or at a ministry level a lot of dynamisms were not happening and primarily if you don't have dynamism in terms of financial cushion and technological cushion and in terms of integrating it into your different plans and actions then uh, probably you it, it's a missed shot right and that's what has been happening so and and the community perspective was never included into those documents so this uh, national vulnerability assessment includes uh, not just the geographies which are exposed or vulnerable but also some sort of communities those are most exposed in addition to that what we need now is uh, step number 1 is to understand which sectors and within sectors what are the elements of risk that have been Uh, exposed to or are uh, basically uh, exposed and vulnerable to different climate threats uh, not just single events but compounded impacts so for that what india needs to do is develop a comprehensive climate risk atlas at a granular level and uh, not just identify the risk but also provide solutions around the sectorial uh, risk and the elements at risk and cw is working in terms of developing this high uh, granular high resolution climate risk atlas to basically understand and identify risk at a very uh, high scale level and of late the other gap that has been happening is we have been trying to project the uncertainties that dr ghosh just mentioned uh, at a time scale of 2050 2100 but what is happening is the impacts those are there are actually our analysis suggested that it's a 0.6 degree rise that is what is taking care of and uh, whatever we are facing is a 0.6 degree rise we don't uh, i mean we are estimating for 2 degree rise but 1.5 degree rise but the 0.6 degree rise is not taken care by us and we we are uh, helpless at this point of time so we need to understand what is hap- going to happen here and now i mean in a 5 year time scale and 10 year time scale what is going to happen and a climate risk atlas like this is going to really help out and in terms of building the adaptation plans we need to prioritize our sectors like agriculture a lot of our, of our population are dependent on agriculture but we need to climate proof all of these sectors by not just building their uh, resilience but trying to identify what exactly are the way forward in terms of in 5 years and 10 years from now how these sectors are going to evolve and how the cross linkages are going to happen if we don't understand those uh, gimmicks and those granular informations then probably we will be able again be having this conversations 5 years and 10 uh, years down the line at a more graver concern so uh, the right at the time we need to uh, discuss it out and as far as india's adaptation plans go it's it's uh, i would suggest it's like uh, uh, inch deep and mile wide uh, kind of thing we still need to go uh, quite a long way okay so how uh, what are the steps that uh, are needed to be taken to cover this long mile is uh, something that will come back to you dr uh, mr mohanty but coming to you dr ghosh with one very interesting aspect that mr mohanty pointed out was the need of a climate risk atlas based on a hazard vulnerability and exposure framework so what is your view how crucial will such a climate risk map or atlas be well you see the point is that adaptation has to be done according to a national plan and regional plan but at the local scale so at the local scale we have to identify the vulnerabilities and as mr mohanty said that interaction with the impacted potentially impacted communities is extremely vital they will be able to give inputs on the stresses that they are currently facing but even more important they will be able to indicate what are their preferred solutions so sometimes people sitting in the ministries technocrats uh, you know in say you know the either the uh, irrigation department or the forestry department that they tend to look upon large scale centralized solutions whereas a lot of useful insights uh, can be obtained about solutions which are much more small scale much more uh, tuned to local uh, local needs and uh, and and realities and then to build up national programs by taking into account these local perspectives and these local choices okay 
Mr. Monty, you also spoke about how we need to climate-proof sectors like agriculture. And this, of course, is a very, very crucial sector for us. We are an agrarian economy, largely dependent on monsoon. But with the threat of uh, monsoons becoming more and more erratic in the coming years due to climate change events, what are the steps that we should be taking? What are the current ones? And what uh, more do we need to do towards working on this? Uh, well, let me give you some more numbers, uh, because why I uh, uh, keep on giving numbers, it's because it, it is more relatable. So every every one degree rise actually tends to make your agri agricultural productivity down by 20 percent. Right. Uh, if there is a heat wave condition that's going on, that, that there has been projections which suggest that India is going to lose 30 million jobs because of heat waves. Uh, the second thing is the Indian industry is going to lose 2% of its revenue because of heat waves. So at one go, when we are talking of climate proofing our agriculture, then the loss that we are seeing is basically 20% loss, 2% uh, of revenue loss for industrial sectors, and at the same time, 30 million jobs because of heat waves. So there's onset events and the chronic events, both of them need to be mapped together and understood at a localized level. The first thing to do is to not just identify the risk at a high resolution level through uh, some of tools like Climate Risk Atlas, but also to understand the nature-based solutions that are available currently. And communities of late, and Indian communities have been having pleothra of these nature-based solutions at their uh, pocket, and they have been practicing them, which are resilient, sustainable, and climate-proofed as well. So uh, we need to enhance, because these are low-hanging fruits, and we need to enhance those practices. The other thing that we need to do for uh, climate-proofing of our sectors, primarily agriculture or industries, um, in that clip, even infrastructures. Uh, because I remember in 1999 when super cyclone hit Odessa, there were more than 10,000 people who lost lives. And uh, almost similar intensity of cyclone when it occurred in 2019, 64 people lost their lives. So where our evacuation plans and resilient plans or adaptation plans have enhanced our loss of lives to be saved, uh, I mean, lives being saved at a larger extent. Our infrastructure lo losses have gone exponentially. So we need to climate-proof our in uh, infrastructures as well. And the first step to do is identify risk. And once we identify risk, we need to ensure them. We need to have tailor-made risk financing instruments developed, not just at a global level, but at a regional level. And those implications should be at a district level or at a very localized level, because city uh, uh, functionaries should have access to this global, global risk pools. And we can climate-proof not just agricultural sector, but our industries, our, uh, uh, our uh, other uh, part of the economic uh, pillars, which can actually take part into the uh, uh, climate-proofing activities. So risk financing is the second step. And third is building a lot of capacity. Capacity in terms of not just understanding or identifying risk, but providing information about how this risk are going to compound, how are they going to impact. So impact-based adaptive enhancement of adaptive capacity is something that I would put forward as a recommendation for building a climate-proof 2030 kind of India uh, in the near go. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ghosh, so Mr. Monty has spoken about how we can climate-proof uh, several of our key sectors that contribute uh, to the country's growth. So, and he's pointed out how vulnerability, vulnerability assessment is, of course, the first step, but there are several other steps that we need to focus on. So what, according to you, do you want to add to what the future direction of work should involve in the coming years? Well, first of all, you know, Mr. Mohanty mentioned about agriculture. And indeed, that this, I, to my mind, is our biggest climate change risk. And I think that what we need to do is to look at broad-based reform of the agricultural sector so that the cropping pattern corresponds to the agro-climatic ecological uh, you know, resources of, of particular regions. Okay. So we have to stop growing uh, you know, water-intensive crops in, in our northwest, which is, uh, you know, which is an arid region. We have to stop growing uh, sugarcane in, in most parts uh, of the country outside, outside perhaps, you know, the eastern states. Uh, so we have to ensure that our cropping patterns, that, that we are able to reform our agricultural sector, 
so that the cropping patterns are consistent with the aggregate ecological endowments of particular areas. The second thing that we have to do is that when we, and this is happening to uh, some extent, I mean, I have already, uh, you know, I have personal knowledge of it, that uh, a number of new industrial investments and infrastructural investments, they are already proceeding on the basis of assessments of climate change in the particular regions that they, that they uh, you know, that, that they are to be set up in. And they are taking into account the projections of climate change impacts. For example, uh, you know, I, I was, uh, you know, in Terry, we did an exercise for a chemicals plant in, in Mumbai, where the focus was on sea level rise. And the uh, new investments that are being made and the existing investments, they are sought to be made climate proof in respect of, uh, in respect of sea level rise. Similarly, when we are, in many cases, when we are planning particularly coastal infrastructure, that the the planning authorities are taking into account, uh, you know, potential, but uh, potential climate change. But this has to be mainstream, and of course, when we mainstream them, we have to understand that the cost, initial upfront cost of these of such infrastructures and projects, they will have to factor in the additional, uh, you know, the risk abatement due to climate change. Now, of course, uh, Mr. Mohanty mentioned about capacity building. And it isn't as if, you know, a certain amount of capacity is to be built in centrally at the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. The point is that the capacity for assessment in the particular context of particular ministries, departments at the centre, at the states, uh, should extend across the board. It should be an all-of-government approach. Absolutely. You know, up this capacity. And not just the government, it should also extend to you know, to think tanks like the CEW, to think tanks like the, like Terry, but also universities, research institutions, this need for capacity building, uh, you know, is, is uh, you know, is, is paramount. And I think that the government should certainly give this question of capacity building a major focus and, you know, uh, ensure that, ensure through funding of projects and training programs that this capacity building is, is is built up and maintained over a period of time. Absolutely, this perhaps uh, both of you have pointed out is the biggest focus area towards addressing these issues. Uh, shifting focus to another interesting aspect, uh, Mr. Mohanty, of this uh, assessment report is that while the greenest part of the country is the most vulnerable to climate change, there are states like Tamil Nadu, like Kerala who come, fall among these seven states that are least vulnerable. In fact, also the hill state of Uttarakhand, where we are seeing a lot of climate change events, experts have attributed these disasters to climate change largely. But is there more than what meets the eye? Because these states, year on year, we are seeing they are also witnessing adverse effects of climate change. Uh, well... Of course, the eye is not seeing whatever it has been shown up. I would suggest that. And our analysis in 2020 that we released uh, certainly showed that 80, uh, more than 89% of the coastal districts are exposed to uh, climate events. So while vulnerability assessment report, you need to understand the limitations of this vulnerability assessment report uh, at the same go as well. You need to understand that this hasn't been an... Uh, event specific or a climate risk specific vulnerability assessment they have, they have included a lot of socio economic parameters which is one of the more most important part uh, into the assessment which has to be brought in and uh, need to be mainstreamed i acknowledge that effort but at the same time we need to identify risk and that has been a miss because we haven't been able to identify what exactly are the risks and let me tell you that the cyclones that we talk of or the floods that we talk of are not just cyclones of floods, right? The floods that happened in Kerala was not just because uh, Kerala received uh, a higher amount of rainfall. It was primarily because uh, in a stretch it had uh, incessant rainfall that happened. The cyclones, those that are happening, are actually localized because your cyclogenesis processes are being triggered because of anthropocentric activities leading to urban heat island kind of effect. So this extreme event identification and the causality factors of the extreme events need to be looked at from a very blinkered and a focused manner. We can't say just like everything looks like similar. 
I mean, in our analysis, we also tried understanding the microclimatic zone change. And not to our surprise, the microclimate is also changing across Indian districts. So within a state, when you have, like India is divided into six major climate zones, the climate zones are swapping within their districts within a same state. So these are the causal factors that we need to address, we need to identify. And once we identify some of those causal factors, we need to see what exactly are the impacts on specific sectors. And specific within specific sectors, what are the elements that have been impacted? And uh, based on that, we need to push our funding uh, because of late, the adaptation funding has been very low in India and primarily dependent on public expenditure. Dr. Ghosh has been working around the climate financing part of the adaptation uh, funding for, uh, for uh, some time uh, now. Uh, he can give a greater purview onto that. But what we need is we need not need to look at the siloed approach of mitigation and adaptation. We need to understand that adaptation and mitigation should go hand in hand and the co-benefits of adaptation and mitigation mitigation can actually help you uh, in terms of building it. The forest that you restore can help you in uh, sequestering carbon. At the same time, they can actually reverse the climate change impacts on a particular geography and location. And at the same time, due to climate change, the extreme forest fire events are also extending. So in last 20 years, 10 tenfold increase in forest fires have happened. And this is because of the dry spells or the increased dry spells, those are happening. So we need to understand all of them by identifying the risk and then understanding the compounded impacts. Until unless we do uh, not acknowledge the compounded impacts and we don't acknowledge that problem is lying uh, in terms of identifying this risk, we can't actually provide a better telomade uh, solution across it. Absolutely. Dr. Ghosh, I'll take one final comment from you on the current efforts that uh, we have been taking uh, at the policy level as part, which, which is as part of the National Action Plan on Climate Change. But of course, as Mr. Monty said, we have traveled a bit, but there's a long way to go. So towards covering that long mile, what more needs to be done in addition to what all has already been pointed out? You see, when the state action plans were originally formulated after 2008, so over a period of two, three years, most of the major states, they formulated their uh, their uh, action plans. But at that time, there was the planning process still available in the country. And so these action plans could actually be dovetailed into the planning process of the country. And they could be funded as part of the planning process. And more, even more important, that they could be implemented and their implementation reviewed and evaluated as part of that process. Now, with the uh, you know apparent termination of this formal planning process in the country, I'm not sure exactly how you know vulnerability assessments and then falling from the vulnerability assessments, the you know the revised state action plans, how exactly will they figure in the overall you know state and central budgets? Uh, Clearly, there are not going to be separate line items, you know, for these uh, for these programs. So exactly how they are going to be integrated into the existing line items of the budgets is still somewhat unclear. And uh, I hope that uh, this this essentially this institutional problem is identified and addressed, uh, you know, uh, if the if the action plans are to be revised and implemented properly. Absolutely. So with that, I'll have to call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you once again to both my guests for joining me on the program and sharing your perspective with us and our viewers. Pleasure having you on the show today. So that's it from us on The Big Picture today. To our viewers, just in case you've missed the television broadcast, let me remind you, you can also watch it on YouTube and Twitter, and you can get back to us with your feedback and suggestions as well. And before I leave, I once again want to urge all our viewers that in the wake of the massive surge of COVID cases, there are simple precautions that we have to take. Please wear your masks whenever you step outside. Keep using sanitizers, washing your hands, and maintain physical distancing if at all you have to step outside. These are simple precautions that we need to take on our part to defeat the ongoing pandemic. So thank you very much for your time. Stay safe, take care of yourselves and your families as well.